Yes. Hello, good morning. I'm André Torre, I'm the president of ERSA, and I wish you presenters, speakers, or attendees, I wish you, for the sake of ERSA, a very nice experience during our 2020 web conference. For ERSA, like for so many people in the world, 2020 is a very special year. Due to the pandemic, we have had to cancel or to help virtually most of our events since the start of the year, like our summer school of Sion with the University of Lausanne, which turned virtual and which was a great success, but at a distance, or our joint conferences with the DG Regio that have been canceled. As time passed, it became obvious that the 16th ERSA Congress of Bolzano in Italy, which was supposed to be held this week, couldn't be organized in the form of physical meeting due to the numerous restrictions of circulation and the social distancing. We have discussed a lot about the situation with the local organizers and had a lot of exchanges in the ERSA office and the board considering various solutions. So, in the end, in agreement with the organizers, we decided to postpone the ERSA Congress of Bolzano to 2021, but also to organize a virtual and very special event. The ERSA 2020 web conference is specially designed for you. We have had to invent a large event and to be innovative in different respects. Although several organizations or associations have decided to cancel their events, we have made a radically different choice and we decided to organize this conference. And in order to give access to a maximum of participants and attendees, we have fixed a symbolic price of admission for this year. The ERSA Conference 2020 is a great event. During 23 days, you will see seven keynote speakers. You will attend to round one round table on regional science and the COVID with prestigious experts, the award of a prestigious ERSA prize, two special sessions for young researchers, around 50 parallel sessions with about 180 presentations of papers, and now more than 400 attendees coming from 45 countries, and also many opportunities to exchange and to share ideas in our rooms or in our places virtually. Before opening and enjoying the conference, I want to warmly thank first the ERSA office with Maristela Angozzi, Nurul Barriero, and Eric Valdener. They did a really great job. In very difficult and peculiar conditions, they had to be very innovative, with a few holidays or none, and to reinvent the organization of the conference with new tools and new ways to communicate and to maintain relations. You can ask them any questions you want and address them your remarks during and after the conference. I also like to thank Vice President Irvin van Leeuwen and the board of ERSA for their advices and their encouragements. And also the organizers of the ERSA Congress of Bolzano 2021 for their help in the organization of this event and their willingness to collaborate to our efforts. So have a nice conference, enjoy the keynotes, the round table, the conference and the presentation and so on. And now it is my pleasure to open the floor to Roberta Capello, the president of ISRE, the Italian Regional Science Association, which supported this manifestation from the start. Roberta, the floor is yours. Thank you, André. Um, on behalf of, the, of ISRE, the Italian section of RSAI, I would also like to welcome you to this event, to this strange but also uh, exciting event. 
uh, we are all experiencing a new way of uh, dealing with a conference. Uh, we were, um, let's say, uh, obliged to go for this uh, uh, way. Uh, of course, I would have much, uh, I would have been much more pleased to welcome you in the nice city of Bozen. I'm not very far from there now, and I can tell you that there is a wonderful uh, sun shining uh, on the mountains. So I hope that next year uh, we can, let's say, enjoy uh, the Dolomites uh, much closer than now. I could show them from you from the window, but it's not very uh, official. So I, will, I can just tell you that there is a wonderful sun. Uh, I would also like, as Andre said, to thank our local organizing committee there, uh, ERAC Research Center, for putting much effort in the first part of the year to organize the physical conference. We were hosted there at the beginning of February, where when the pandemic situation was not there, uh, and we could enjoy uh, their city, uh, the, the, the center, the, col uh, the, center the, the, the research center, and we could visit whatever we would have liked to do with you uh, in these days. And I can assure you that everything was perfectly under control. Uh, and then we obliged to change our uh, plans, and we are now here, as Andre said, we put a lot of effort, uh, especially ERSA office, but uh, also the LOC, the LOC, the local organizing committee to uh, organize this situation. So we also hope from the, our side that you will enjoy as much as possible the uh, event, the web event, uh, just for your uh, knowledge next week from the 2nd to the 4th of September, uh, ISRA will help the, uh, its annual lecture, its annual conference, we will have a lot of um, presentations, more than 400 uh, speakers will be there uh, with uh, the um, uh, plenary sessions that will be on in streaming. So if you like and you are not fed up by uh, listening, uh, that we will also have an interesting conference there. So you can join in streaming the opening sessions the, and the uh, plenary sessions that are uh, free and uh, uh, in English. Uh, so uh, welcome and uh, have a nice uh, 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 web conference. Thank you. So thank you very much, um, Roberta. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Simin Davoudi from Newcastle University. Uh, Simin Davoudi is director of the Global Urban Research Unit and co-director of Newcastle University Center for Cities. She is also past president of ESOP, the Association of European Schools of Planning, and fellow of the Royal Town Planning Institute, the Academy of Social Sciences, and the Royal Society of Arts. Her introductory keynote will be about regional imaginaries and the Europe of Regions projects related to her recent book, Hope and the Neoliberal Austerity, held in 2021 on Policy Press. So Simin, thank you very much to have accepted to deliver the introductory speech for the ERSA 2020 conference. Thank you very much. Floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. And let me start with the screen sharing before I say anything. Okay, well, thank you very much, Andre, for that introduction. And, and also thanks to ERSA for the invitation. Uh, Roberta, I also wish I were in uh, Bozol rather than sitting in my own study and talking to my computer, basically. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, I haven't come here to talk to you about a utopia. No, I'm here to talk to you about an adventure, the federating 
of Europe. These are the words of a Swiss scholar, Denise de Rougemont, given in a talk in 1948 at the Sorbonne. He was advocating for cultural and historical regions to become the sub-European to become the sub-European political units instead of nation states. I started with his statement not because I necessarily agree with his views, but because he is the person who coined the term Europe of the regions in his book, which appeared in the 60s in English. Donald Tusk, the former EU president, called him a philosopher of regionalism and a pioneer of the EU motto, unity in diversity. I started with him because his take on what constitutes Europe. In the, con in the conclusion to his book, he suggests that the search for Europe is to build Europe, that Europe is only to be found in the process of creating it. This somewhat resonates with what I'm going to say about regions and about Europe of, a reg Europe of the regions. Ever since this bird's eye view of Chicago adorned the cover of Bernheim's plan back in 1909, regional space has been subject to multiple and competing imaginaries. Geographers have emphasized that there is no single objective region out there waiting to be defined that there is nothing ontologically given about the traditional divisions between urban and regional, national and global scales. Nevertheless, region is often still taken as a given, as a bounded territory neatly positioned in a nested hierarchy from local to the global. Contrary to this, territorial view, there are multiple imaginaries of the region, like the ones that I have listed here on this slide. And these are jostling for the position of dominance in the politics of scalar fixing. However, I would argue that despite this diversity, the economic imaginary has prevailed and since the 1990s become co-constitutive of a neoliberal political project. And this to some extent explains the limited success of the European regionalization goal. Before I elaborate on this, I'll say a few words about the two concepts that are central to my argument, imaginary and scalar fixing. Although the term imaginary is used in a growing body of literature, it is rarely engaged with conceptually. And this is despite the fact that as a concept, imaginary has a long intellectual history going back to the works of the 19th century philosophers and sociologists, such as Hegel and his notion of a spirit of a people, and Durkheim and his notion of collective consciousness. The use of the term itself can be traced to the work of Mill's sociological imagination back in 1959 and Castoriadis imaginary institutions of society in 1975. Its more recent incarnation draws on Benedict Anderson's imagined communities and Charles Taylor's 
definition of social imaginaries as the ways people imagine their social existence and how they fit together with others. So social imaginary is that which produces a community, holds it together by giving it temporary coherence and identity and subjecting it to change. The concept was introduced to geographical scholarship by Edward Said's work on Orientalism. He showed how the spatial imaginaries of Orient were constructed and circulated through a plethora of ideas and artifacts to pursue colonial ambitions. What he added to the established mental mapping traditions of behavioral geographers was a Foucauldian layer, which turned his imaginative geographies into profoundly ideological landscapes whose representation of a space are entangled with relations of power. So rather than seeing spatial imaginaries as a static linguistic representation of actually existing places out there, Said saw them as performative acts, which through a nexus of power, knowledge, and geography, call certain scales, such as the region, into being, and legitimize certain political goals, such as European regionalization. The questions, however, remain, what motivates regionalization as a political goal? Why do we see periodic reconfigurations of governance structures? Addressing these questions bring me to the second concept, the scale or fixing. This built on David Harvey's provocation that capitalism cannot do without its spatial fixes. That the endemic crisis of capital accumulation are contingently resolved by rescaling of governance powers and responsibilities. Inspired by the work of Henri Lefebvre, he suggests that the inner contradictions of capitalism are expressed through the restless reformation of geographical landscapes. This restless scale or fixing is of course a contested political process infused with tensions and contradictions and with uncertain outcomes. Since the Second World War, in Europe and in many nation states, regions have been key candidates for a scale or fixing. Imagined as economic spaces, they've been periodically invoked as the right scale of governance, but with two distinct ideological rationalization what I would call a cohesion-oriented welfare state rationality and a competitiveness-oriented neoliberal rationality. I will elaborate on these in turn. In the post-war Fordist economy and Keynesian welfare state, regions were invoked as the right scale for distribution of national economic growth and reduction of territorial disparities. Emphasis was very much put on steering development opportunities, public funding and private investments to economically disadvantaged regions. A classic example of this is Gravier's promotion of growth poles outside Paris. At the European level, 
This rationality was reflected in the Treaty of Rome, which aimed to reduce the differences between the regions and achieve harmonious development. It was also in the early, echoed in the early EU regional policies that aim to improve the harmony of regional structures. Regions were imagined as Keynesian economic spaces for enacting the egalitarian ideals of European social models. However, many such constructed regions remained subordinated to distributive imperatives of the center and served primarily as transmission belts for national economic and social policies. At the European level, nation states called the shots and remained in charge of negotiating the allocation of the European Regional Development Funds. In the late 1980s, the rationalization of regional imaginaries began to change in response to post-Fordist crisis of globalizing capitalism, which in Europe were compounded by the introduction of the single European market and the economic and monetary union. Both of these were expected to increase regional disparities, as you can see in the warning given by the ESDP. So throughout the 80s and 90s, the EU, like many nation states, tried to re-energize regional rescaling. It actively pursued the Europe of the region's goal through a number of direct and indirect mechanisms, such as the ones that are shown on this slide. Through these and other material and discursive practices, economic imaginaries of the region was circulated and performed to solidify regions as the right scalar fixes of post this crisis. But this time, with a radically different rationality, which put greater emphasis on economic competitiveness, entrepreneurial governance, endogenous growth, and regions for themselves. As you can see at the bottom of the slide in this UK ministerial statement, regions were brought to the fore, or rather called into being, on the basis of such rationalities. Even in social democratic countries, such as Denmark, traditional egalitarian values were dismissed as outdated political goals. In a speech before the Lisbon summit, Tony Blair criticized European social models as outdated and urged the EU leaders to make a definitive stand in favor of market reform. A key contribution to the new rationalization of rescaling came from influential theories by economic geographers. Implicitly, they equated a Europe of nations with the Fordist mass production and a Europe of the regions with the post for this flexible specialization. As Charles Taylor suggests, although imaginaries are not theories or doctrines per se, they may start by discursive practices of theorists. And as these practices gain traction through repetition and circulation, they generate more far-reaching claims on political life. And that is exactly what happened in the 1990s, when neoliberal economic imaginaries of the region were promoted and legitimated by a distinct 
epistemic rationality called new regionalism. This had three underlying claims. The primacy of economic agglomeration, the determining role of the so-called institutional thickness, and the hollowing out of nation states. Together, they invoked regions as agents of wealth creation, crucible of economic development in post fordist era, and prime scales for post-Keynesian governance. Some even predicted that by the 1990s, we would leave the Europe of competing nationalism behind us, and that the nation state would break up and a European Federation of Equal Regions would be created. These widely circulated neo-regionalist ideas essentialized the region as the optimal scale or fix of neoliberal political economy. This statement by an EU official shows the extent to which this became ingrained in the elite's imagination. New regionalists also sparked a host of normatively charged claims, which not only described what a region was, they also prescribed what it ought to be. Some regions were glorified as success stories, as the motors of economic growth, and as the leading edges of the contemporary post fordist economy. Others were stigmatized as lagging behind, peripheral, and beyond salvation. Imaginaries such as these create binary views of the world as Orient and Occident, Europe as core and periphery, and countries as North and South or East and West. <clears throat> these dualities are mediated and performed by myriads of cartographical practices, metaphorical significations, calculations, and classifications. <clears throat> Idealized imaginaries disseminate narratives of their own inevitability and become self-fulfilling prophecies. And places that don't live up to the glorified images of superstars no longer matter, as was bluntly suggested by an economist recently. He told the conference full of Liverpudlians that Liverpool had no future and its population should move to the southeast of England. Some people dismissed his remarks as laughable, but as others noted, it was not a laughing matter at all. It was rather a terrifying glimpse of a neoliberal strategy for cutting back public spending in places that were considered to be beyond salvation. Places that the current British Prime Minister calls dry rivetus. Although neo-regionalism helped to depoliticize the Europe of the Regions project by giving it scientific legitimacy, it couldn't eradicate the politics of rescaling and the political struggle for coalition building, which is reflected in the spectrum of the opponents and proponents of the project. Among the proponents are firstly those who support regionalization as a pathway to devolution of power and enhanced local democracy. They resonate with Bruno Dente's, what Bruno Dente calls cooperative federalism. These are looking for shared competencies 
and joint policy making in the EU multi-level governance system, which includes the nation states. Secondly, there are the so-called regional nations, such as Scotland and Catalonia, with a strong sense of cultural identity and historical claims to self-determination and sovereignty. They could be seen as coordinative federalists. They support European regionalization because it offers them a gateway to in independence whilst lowering its cost because they continue to benefit from association with the EU as a larger political collective. And this is very clearly reflected in these statements by a Catalan separatist leader and also by Scotland's first minister. Regional nations epitomize Benedict Anderson's imagined communities, demonstrating that a nation exists when a significant number of people imagine themselves to form a nation or behave as if they have formed one. Their socio-spatial imaginary not only bring their region into existence, it also shapes their own identity. They see themselves as an imagined regional community. A third group of supporters are what Dente calls competitive federalists, notably the rich regions, which want the evolution of tax power and enhancement of their own competitive advantage. Among the opponents of a Europe of the regions are firstly the nation states, which consider themselves as the losers of the changing power geometries. Secondly, there are anti-EU parties, which over the last decade have almost doubled their votes and contributed to the deterioration of public opinions about the EU and trust in its institutions. The biggest irony of all this is that both the opponents and the supporters are jeopardizing the Europe of the Regions project, one inadvertently and the other deliberately. Supporters inadvertently undermine the very project that they support because their desire for independence is interpreted as the beginning of political instability and hence the dismantling of the EU economic integration, which has always been the core political goal. Opponents deliberately undermine not just a Europe of the regions, but also the whole idea of Europe and its integration. There are many reasons for the recent rise in anti-EU sentiments. But one important factor is the growing geographies of discontent. And this is the consequence of the neoliberal turn in the EU regional policies and their economic imaginaries of the region. Rodriguez Pose calls this phenomena the revenge of the places that don't matter. To understand this phenomena, we need to look closer at neoliberal approaches to inequalities and their over-reliance on the invisible hand of the market rather than government intervention. For Friedrich Hayek, a key intellectual architect of neoliberalism, the ideal solution for tackling disparities was the self-organizing dynamics of the market which he called a theory of a spontaneous order. The neoliberal rationality that is echoed here in the Economist Journal 
dismisses fairness as a value, considers any intervention in agglomeration forces as a waste of resources, and suggests that the best we can do is to let the growing cities and regions grow further, and then their benefit will reach elsewhere. But these trickle-down assumptions have proven wrong. Inequalities are growing, and many places are kept behind by decades of neglect and underinvestment. But I want to say that economic disparities are not the only factors in the limited success of European regionalization project. There are equally important social and cultural factors. So far, Europe of the regions has remained an elite project motivated primarily by economic imaginaries of the region and performed through technocratical practices. What's been missing are social and cultural practices that assign meanings to particular places. Practices such as cultural traditions, rituals, legends, languages, stories, and memories, which can bind together heterogeneous and spatially dispersed people into imagined regional communities. While many such communities exist all over Europe, their spatial imaginaries don't necessarily correspond with governments or EU's constructed regions. An example of such, such, a, dis, such a mismatch came to the fore at the height of regionalization in the 1990s, when the UK government tried to institutionalize the regions, the regional scale, by using the standard demarcation of official regions. This was heavily opposed by Cornwall, an area in the Southwest region with a strong sense of its Cornish identity. This statement by the spokesperson is a good indication of the mismatch between governments and people's imaginaries of what and where the region is. He said, before we go down the road of deciding what we want to do, we ought to ask ourselves what it is we mean by the term region. Because we have a very strong sense of ourselves, our geography, our culture, and so on. As I said, new regionalism provided scientific legitimacy for the Europe of the region project. But in doing so, it replaced its traditional cultural principle of unity in diversity with a neoliberal economic principle of fragmented competition, where the winner takes all. So in some ways, New regionalist rationality helped to kill off the regionalization project. And his prediction about the death of the nation state proved to be greatly exaggerated. On the contrary, nationalism in its various guises is on the rise. And the COVID induced crisis might make it even more pronounced. In any case, rescaling of governance can only offer a temporary solution to the crisis of capitalism, which means that the search for a new scalar fix and its constitutive scalar imaginaries continues, as do the tension between different rationalities for legitimizing them. In many countries, attentions have already moved away 
from the region to the city region as the new article of faith for leveling up and reducing spatial inequalities. <clears throat> the critical questions for researchers are how scalar and spatial imaginaries emerge, circulated, and solidified? Why certain imaginaries become dominant? What kind of rationalities legitimize them? And what political projects do they serve? These are not merely blue sky academic questions. They have practical implications for justice, democracy, and sustainability. Because the way we imagine places influence how we plan their futures. As Edward Said suggested many years ago, the struggle over geography is not only about soldiers and cannons, but also about ideas, forms, images, and imaginings. Thank you. So thank you very much, uh, Simin, for this broad and uh, encompassing um, very, very um, um, agenda, and also about all the information which are contained in. So for all the participants, you are more than 100 there. You can ask your questions now on, and then, and then before on the portal. But um, at that moment, I have one question um, to ask you, or maybe a few ones. Um, but my first uh, question is about um, the question of um, the nations versus red regions. Uh, don't you think that there have been, a, there or there is a struggle nowadays between the vision on, of the EU on the one hand the visions of the European countries, on the other hand, regarding the question of, of regions. So on the one hand, the EU is pushing towards maybe a Europe of a nation, or I don't know, a, a Europe of a region, or in the, let's say, to the regions, in, in any sense. And on the other hand, a lot of countries put the brakes on that. So that's my first question. I also have a question about the policies, but maybe we can start with that interrogation. Well, yes, you're absolutely right, uh, Andre, that these, uh, these tensions uh, are continuing, obviously. Um, and, and the outcome of the, the kind of the political struggle that you were mentioning is always uncertain. Um, but it is true that, uh, you know, the whole, the Europe of the regions idea um, has been there for many, many years. And obviously, some people support it, some people oppose it, and for different reasons, and for different um, political reasons, primarily. Um, so I wouldn't say that, you know, we can, there is, there is, there is an end to this. I think uh, as long as there is such a thing as a European uh, kind of European Union, um, as a political collective, we will see these uh, kind of forces struggling for position of dominance. So, uh, yes, obviously, nation states are, if, if the Europe of the region, uh, the regions actually materializes, then, uh, then the nation states are the loser of that. So it's very, it's very, it's inevitable and it's, uh, it's not surprising that often not in favor of it. Okay, thank you very much. I have another question. It is related to a question which has been asked in the chat. And it's about the question of uh, inequality, uh, of uh, raising uh, inequality, region inequality. And also I will relate it to um, the question of um, cities versus uh, regions. Because in, in the recent year, a lot of stress has been put on the cities and not only of, on the regions. Uh, and in the end, 
it's not very, it's not so clear. It's the, 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 the funds are really put to the regions or if they are put to the core of the big cities in the region at the expense of the other parts of the region. It, it's also something quite complicated as well. Absolutely, uh, yeah, I, I think that that is the actual, the core of what I was trying to um, articulate. Um, and uh, other people, um, much more qualified on, on those aspects than, than me, uh, have talked about it in, at length, that um, the idea of this, what Ron Martin calls agglomeration bias, is not working. You know, putting so much emphasis on putting all our resources into the big cities and the growing cities, and hoping for the best, that at one point these will, will, be, will trickle down or out, into other places is not working. Uh, without direct intervention in those other places, um, what we are seeing now uh, is rising inequalities. And to some extent, the, the kind of the rise of anti-EU sentiments that we've seen or voting for anti-EU parties or Eurosceptic parties is partly due to that these problems with inequalities and problems that, I mean, people being told that the places that they call home and they have strong emotional and family ties and history and heritage uh, are now beyond salvation and cannot be helped. So obviously that creates a lot of resentment and a lot of anger out there. And our former prime minister called these the left behind places. And I think that is the wrong sort of statement because it somehow uh, gives the idea that there is some kind of self-afflicted harm that people in those places have done to themselves rather than the fact that what's happening in these places is the mirror of what's happening in the growing places. And it's, it's, there are lots of global structural forces that have led us to where we are and, and misguided policies, which is the one that you are, uh, whoever may ask the question is alluding to, policies that think that we should concentrate all our investment where, in places where the return is higher. It gives a higher yield rather than where the need is greater. Uh, there is a, on the chat, thank you very much, there is a question about the, the borders of the region um, related to the borders um, uh, of nations and the borders of, of Europe. I will also add a part of my personal experience regarding France, where there have been this reform in the big regions now. And now uh, it's pretty obvious that a lot of people in those regions doesn't feel uh, comfortable with the region or doesn't feel the sentiment of belonging to those regions. So they think, okay, there is now there is a capital of a region, it's quite far away from my place. So does this mean in the end that we come back to territories in front of versus region or something like that? Mm -hmm. Well, absolutely. And, and I'm not necessarily saying this applies to everywhere in Europe, but there is a massive mismatch between what the, you know, the analysts and the government officials consider where the region is and actually people on the ground and what they think their region is. And the examples, the example that I used from the Southwest, as I said, this was in the 1990s. We don't talk about regions anymore in this, uh, at the moment. That's not the focus of rescaling. In the UK, it's very much city regions these days. But that has its own issues and I have written about that elsewhere. But the, 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 the example was trying to say that the stand, we have a standard regions. They are random. They don't really correspond with any historical, cultural regions. Uh, while within those regions, there are places that people feel a strong affinity to, and they consider that as their region. So, um, yeah, there is, there are all these, um, that, that is why I was trying to use the word imaginaries, because um, not that they have been imaginaries in terms of something that is not existing, 
but in terms of something which gets constructed by um, through kind of social practices. Um, I have also another question related to the, to the topic of region versus um, territories related to the smart development policies um, of Europe. Because um, obviously this policy is a great progress because it takes into account locality or it takes into account different places. But uh, it's not quite obvious that it is really place-based. It's much more regions-based or something like that. Um, and for example, when you have those big, big regions now, the one you were stating, which, which are quite composite ones, sometimes the, the EU policy addresses um, some policy to one region, but in this region, there, is, there are a lot of diversity. And sometimes, and we come back to the previous question a bit, sometimes those policies are directed towards the big cities and not towards the peripheries of those regions, of the different territories of these regions as well. So maybe yeah. there is a, a black hole there. Well, y y yes, I mean, I didn't have time to talk about what I think are some of the um, deficiencies and problems with the EU cohesion policy. EU cohesion policy obviously is the main, the main instrument of the EU for tackling disparities and regional inequalities. <clears throat> but again, and, and uh, uh, scholars have written about it at length, is that even, which is very, I mean, I think the most troubling thing is that some of the anti-EU uh, sentiments or uh, voting for uh, Eurosceptic parties are actually coming from the biggest beneficiaries of the cohesion, of cohesion funding. So it is really time for us to sit back and, and ask what's gone wrong, what's happening there. And I would suggest that there are the, way is, the ways in which and the rationale behind the way in which the cohesion policy is working, is that what I called neoliberal sort of rationality. And that is why, you know, funding gets spent in places that are already growing and have the capacity to absorb the money that gets spent. So in a way, it may even add to the disparities of within, within the regions. Um, and the, the other problem is that um, the, 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 way, the way the cohesion funding is working is very much top-down and formula-based transfer of cash, basically, which is not what people call place-based or place-sensitive policies, because to have a place-sensitive or place-based policy you have to start from the ground up. You need for the policy to be locally led. It needs to start with the challenges and opportunities of the place and tailor-made policies should be what the cohesion policy should fund rather than you know, just moving uh, money from A to B and hoping that it will just get spent. A lot of the cohesion funding doesn't get even spent because the capacity and ca is not there for it to be spent. So, and a lot of it gets spent on upgrading physical infrastructure and sometimes what we call white elephant infrastructure, you know, airports that nobody use, a train stations that nobody use, just because the money has to be spent. It's not, uh, as I said, it is, there is, these are the places that have been kept behind by part by misguided or uh, policies that uh, are uh, following the wrong rationality about how to tackle inequalities and disparities. Okay, thank you. There is another, there is another question on the chat about the, the possible opportunities of green policies versus uh, territories or regionalism. Are there 
uh, are there an, an opportunity to come back to the territories or to the regions in the, because they are ma mainly or fully they are mainly uh, settled uh, or grounded like in circular economy or things mm -hmm. like that so is that an opportunity regarding to the big uh, plan now that's a very good that's a very good point um, uh, whoever has made it um, yes of course there is that uh, there is that kind of potential there um, it, it could be part of the big mix of locally led uh, policies and and with a focus on as you said the circular economy aspect of it and the kind of um, attempt to um, you know to, to reduce the distances that the goods are traveling and so on I think this could be, yeah, this could be. I mean, I'm sure colleagues know that a new territorial, a draft territorial agenda has just been issued under the German presidency. And that uh, the framing that it's using is about green and just Europe. But again, I think we need to be very careful because some of these, these words, and by the way, a smart city is one of those um, sort of uh, terminologies, that they all sound very good. It's very difficult to challenge them. But when we look at the details, the way they are implemented, what is behind them, who has actually started it off, and what, what, what is behind the, the whole idea and how it gets kind of circulated everywhere, I think we need to be rather careful and inquisitive about it rather than take them as given and good ideas. So the idea is, of course, very good, but we have to wait and see how it gets implemented and what sort of political purposes it serves. Okay, thank you very much. I have another question about the, the, the EU cohesion policies and the collaboration between the regions. So to be sure not to spoil it, I, I okay, I read it if I can. So the idea is EU cohesion policies are pushing collaborations. However, at the end of the day, the EU Commission is assessing the regions from territorial lace based approach, not regional networks. How can you see that? Well, yes, there are some sort of, yeah, well, I, I don't know the details of, of how these things get assessed, but, but um, there is the tension between, on the one hand, collaboration and cooperation, and on the one hand, kind of competitive competition is going to be there. And, and the, some, of, some of the problems with cohesion policy is because of some of these, the ways in which it gets the monitoring and assessment and target setting and performance settings are set, which creates an obstacle for even some of the, um, you know, the broader ideas around collaboration. Okay, so um, I think that we... Um... Andre? Yes. Roberta, Sorry, please. just uh, to congratulate yes. Simin for this very interesting and broad uh, overview of what happened in the, in the literature and in our uh, history about the concept of regionalism and so on. I was a little bit um, um, captured by the fact that you never mentioned identity. And uh, uh, I know by the, 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 the research I did that uh, there is a huge uh, debate on how uh, identity is built and how the different layers of identity uh, interact uh, one another. Uh, regional identity, national identity, European identity. And I think that on what you, uh, in what you tell us, um, what is one, one of the main drivers is the fact that the, the determinants of these different layers of identity change their relative weight. So at the end you have sort of um, social, uh, areas where the weight of one identity is goes over the other. So I think that this is something that is, let's say, much mentioned in the literature and much studied. I would like to, to, to know your view on that and uh, how this is related to the 
very, very nice his story that you uh, delivered to us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Roberto. I think, I think you put your finger on a very, very important, um, very important uh, aspect. And it is very much also debated in uh, the literature around social imaginary. And the idea is that social imaginary and individuals' identities are very much intertwined. They're co-constitutive of each other. I mentioned it very briefly, but you write, I never did justice to the whole idea of identity, that people's social and spatial imaginaries not only bring the actual, let's say, region or city or whatever scale we talk about into being, it also creates their own identity. They see themselves as part of a particular community. But you're absolutely right, and, and I'm very well aware that we do not have a single identity. All of us have multiple identities. Some of it is related to the issues around, you know, scale, my national identity, my local. So, but there are also around other social aspects of our identity. You know, do you see yourself as, uh, and also gender identity these days. So it is a very, very important um, point and it's very important for researchers to pay attention to it. But I'd like to say something also else about the notion of identity. Because it is, as I say, identities are constructed. You know, media plays a massive role in the way in which our identities are built. But what I want to say is that it seems to me that at this point in time, then the whole, the whole process of identity building has been hijacked and used and abused by certain forces. The, what we call populism is very much related to the question of identity. But for progressive, but progressive sort of ideas and forces cannot afford to neglect the question of identity. I mean, the left probably um, doesn't like to talk about identity because there are issues around it. It could be divisive, identities could be divisive, but they could also bring people together. And it's very important that we actually take identity seriously and see how, we can, how identity can mobilize towards progressive um, sort of projects, if you like. Uh, I have just uh, read and uh, was part of a project where uh, regional cohesion was analyzed in terms of its capacity to build regional uh, and European, sorry, a European identity. And one failure of regional cohesion was seen in that perspective. Mm -hmm. The fact that they were, it was not able to build a consensus around the, uh, the image of Europe as a European Union. Uh, yes. Um, regional yeah. was a, a bit weak in that respect. Yeah, it was a, I read, I can't remember where it was, but it was a headline in, in, in an article in a, one of the newspapers, um, which said, uh, you know, European Union has spent a lot of money, but it hasn't bought them love. <laughs> That's true. Thank you, Zimi. Thank you very much. Thank you, Roberto. Okay. Thank you for all of you. Pleasure. Thank you, uh, Simin, for this broad and very enlightened uh, overview, and also thank for you. the insights uh, for the future. And thank you to Patricia. Pleasure. The, the, Thanks for having me. Yeah. This Congress. Thank you very much. It was now a great for, we, we <laughs> will And thank you, Roberta, to take part to, to, to this. And uh, now for all the participants and the attendees, we will uh, close the session and we will uh, reopen at 11. And from 11 to 12.30, there will be uh, six uh, parallel sessions. So you can go to the rooms and then to uh, go to your session at that moment. And in the meantime, there is a, an online 
networking break, so you can network with the other participants, uh, or my, uh, either randomly by joining the conversation, with max um, four people in a room, with a limit of uh, four minutes of conversation. And also you can join the meeting hub by returning to the timeline and clicking to the meeting hub button on the right hand side of your screen. And then you can select um, participants. So let's make a try and let's try to interact at a distance, uh, hopefully the best that we can. So thank you very much. Thank you all of us. And we see you at 11 for the next session. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.